Welcome to The Conversation. I am Carrie Ann and I will be your host for this first segment. I am of course joined by Jared, our resident astronomer, as well as Mike, our rocket specialist. And behind us, we have Adetta, who will be producing the show today. Today in news we have... Dawn continues its mission at Ceres. And Virgin Galactic gets a billion dollar investment. And then in our second segment, Jared here will be having an interview with author Chris Prophet about the future of SpaceX. It's going to be a really interesting one. And then, of course, in our third segment, we get back to your comments and questions about last week's show. But this is tomorrow, t Orbit 10.40. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? At the top of the show, like I always want to do, I give a huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. These are of the Escape Velocity variety. They, of course, get their name in the show at all three segments. Access to our exclusive Patreon only hangouts, early access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand, early access to view only copy of the show, rundown, free worldwide swag, uh, uh, worldwide shipping in the swag store, read only access to tomorrow host channel, which is amazing, voting rights to upcoming roundtable <laughs> discussions, access to our Escape Velocity Discord channel, and so much more. If you are interested in any of these things, I know I'm like the micro machine man, any of these things and anything else really head on over to patreon.com slash tmro i figure i never actually read all of them uh so you know maybe once a month i'll try to speed through that as quickly as possible so what the rewards you actually can get <laughs> so many of them and more to come of course uh, That's we're, a lot. we're always sort of retooling some of those things we want to make sure that you feel that you are getting out of the show as much as you are putting into the show so uh, that's that's where all of that is coming from. So the very next thing that we usually like to do is talk about launches, and for that I usually turn well, we to didn't Mike. Have any this week? And th yeah, that's a really sad panda. Ah. <laughs> that's okay because well, we're gonna uh, have a bunch next week though, so that'll be fun. Exactly. I, I feel like uh, week over week we kind of have this sort of thing of like it's feast or famine around here sometimes. So uh, sometimes we make Mike <laughs> dance for the first ten minutes of the show, and other times uh, we tell him he can take a break for like a half second. Uh, <laughs> so for those of you wondering. No launches, but that's okay. We will get back to it. We, because uh, we are the ones who do the launches, by the way. Uh, we will get back to doing that next week. So, uh, Mr. Jared, you are going to be up first. Yeah. Let's... And you were saying something, something, something about series? Yeah, series. Of course, we're all big fans of Dwarf Planets uh, totally. here at Tomorrow. So, uh, we got to talk about Dawn, which is currently at Ceres, mm -hmm. the largest dwarf planet within the, ba the planetary boundary of the solar system at the moment. It's been granted a mission extension. Oh, now, it was launched in 2007, and it's the only spacecraft that's actually orbited two celestial bodies in the solar system outside of the Earth and Moon system. So, oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, and it does that because it has ion engine propulsion. Um, and as we always like to note, uh, if you're a big Star Wars fan, TIE Fighter, TIE stands for Twin Ion Engine. Mm -hmm. Well, Dawn has three ion engines on it, so... Uh, step up, uh, Galactic Empire. Now, <laughs> it, it rendezvoused and it uh, went into orbit around the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, Vesta, in 2011, and then used its ion engine to leave orbit in 2012 and went on its way to Ceres, uh, which is the largest dwarf planet in the asteroid belt, only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, it arrived there in 2015. Now, the data collected by Dawn has actually shown us that Ceres is rife in volatiles like water. Water ice, which potentially makes Ceres an excellent place for us to use as a pit stop on our way to further places out in the solar system, and it might potentially have a subsurface ocean. The jury's kind of still out on that, so we need more data. And the nice thing about that is that this is Dawn's second mission extension, so we're going to get some more data. Now, it was unknown if Dawn would actually be given permission to continue its mission, as three of the four reaction wheels that control pointing the spacecraft have failed, but the engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory came up with an ingenious solution to balance the added of Dawn by using a combination of its hydrazine fueled reaction control thrusters and its ion drive engines. So Dawn is going to be moving 
into its closest orbit yet around Ceres. It's only going to be about 200 kilometers above the surface. And its previous closest orbit was only about 385 kilometers above the surface of Ceres. This low orbit should provide increased resolution and resolving power for all of the instruments that Dawn carries. Now, depending on the health of the spacecraft and a report on the remaining fuel on board in 2018, a decision will be made as to whether to extend Dawn's mission for a third time or back out Dawn to an orbit that will allow it to be uh, sort of like a safe graveyard orbit around uh, Ceres. That way we prevent uh, Dawn from crashing into Ceres, potentially contaminating the surface of Ceres because Dawn was built to certain specifications, but obviously, like many missions we send out, we didn't realize there was going to be so much water ice at Ceres, yeah. uh, and that's something that we don't want to contaminate. Uh, and that's not something that we really discovered until we got there. So, right. uh, yeah, it's a, it's been a, a pretty interesting mission. And I love that image of uh, Occitator Crater with the white spots there, which are salt deposits on the surface. I was just going to say, there was so. a question in the chat room mm -hmm. uh, from YouTube. Uh, Jim Bird said, did we find out what the white blob on Ceres is? Yes. Uh, so salt, right? Salt deposits, specifically magnesium sulfate that we think is coming up from under the surface. It comes to the surface, and then it, because there's no real atmosphere on Ceres, uh, it just comes kind of uh, goes straight from a uh, liquid to a gas. It just uh, it just <laughs> comes out like that. It's it's literally Epsom salts. So, nice. so the same stuff you wow. soak your feet in. I was just saying, when we get Earth, there, we can, uh, we can uh, have, have nice baths. Ceres will actually be a spa uh, by the time we call them. That would be so suppose. awesome. So, maybe. So. Ceres spa. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. So. Oh, that's so, so many ideas uh, that nobody wants to hear out of my head right now. Uh, all right, so thank you, Jared. I appreciate that. You got that. Mr. Mike, uh, a company that we haven't actually talked about in a little bit here, uh, Virgin. Specifically, more uh, like it's all a Virgin Group, right? Has uh, has got some yeah. more funding as of late. Tell me what's going on there over there. Yeah, so we're talking about Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, and the Spaceship Company. They have gotten a one billion dollar investment. Well, I mean, check hasn't been signed yet, but they have pretty much signed up a partnership with the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, the, mm. the government of Saudi Arabia. So uh, what this partnership is hoping to do is accomplish several things and is going to make the, the, the country, Saudi Arabia, a primary stakeholder in Virgin Galactic and Spaceship <laughs> Company and Virgin Orbit. Uh, <laughs> so that's all going to be very interesting for sure. Yeah. Um, but with this, uh, there is an option to have an additional $480 million of, of additional funding as well. Mm -hmm. Now, this was all agreed upon by Prince Mohammed bin Salman al Saud, who's there on the right. He's the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And not only that, but he's also the deputy prime minister, the chairman of the Council of Economic and Developmental Affairs, and of the, the chairman of the Public Investment Fund. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can see uh, Sir Richard Branson there on uh, the left. Now, Prince Mohammed said that this partnership with Virgin Group will not only help the economy of Saudi Arabia, but the future of Saudi Arabia as well, from an economic, technology, and knowledge standpoint to advance the country. Now, Sir Richard mm. Branson, of course, uh, the founder of Virgin Group, said that he was very happy about this new partnership and reiterated that they would be launching people and satellites into space very soon. He also mentioned that they would push their supersonic transport ambitions as well, which it seems they may have a concept design of now. Um, they at least showed this at a, 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 a recent conference, anyway, in Saudi Arabia. Now, the in intended investments not only will be able to cover things like this supersonic trans transportation, and this might be the primary focus of this investment, mm. but it's also going to, you know, uh, if they get the regulatory approval, resort uh, to have, like I said, uh, PIF being the public investment fund having a significant stake in Virgin Galactic. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's not only going to support their human spaceflight plans, but it's also going to accelerate their manufacturing uh, and operational capabilities for Virgin Galactic. And it's also going to um, develop, or rather help aid in the development of their small satellite launch systems as well. So lots of crazy, crazy stuff could be happening. There also is, is, is uh, mentions of some sort of development of a space-centric entertainment industry in Saudi Arabia. So who knows what that could look like in the 
the future. But uh, in, in any case, uh, they're going to be working together for quite some time. And uh, in another piece of exciting news, mm -hmm. Virgin Galactic has received an approved launch license from the FAA to operate out of Spaceport America in Yay. New Mexico for Spaceship Two. So they could actually be six months away this time. <laughs> That would be well, super you know. exciting. You know, everything's lining up. Yeah. Oh, that would be super exciting. Uh, you know, that's that's we we poke fun. We poke fun at friends, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're not trying to be too harsh on Virgin. Uh, it's just you know, at any time you say you're about six months away, and then it's three or four or five years later, uh, it's uh, it's it's a little. You know, it becomes funny after a certain point, I suppose. Spaceships are hard. Yeah. Dude, so. spa space in general, I feel, is just yeah. really, really difficult. It's difficult. Oh, goodness. Okay. Spit. So, um, <laughs> normally, I, I have to point out really quickly, normally, a lot of the things that you talk about, A, I know nothing about, which is great because then I'm learning. Mm -hmm. At least I'm trying to. Uh, but then, B, I also can't pronounce them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I looked at this and I was like, Euclid. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's there's a street in Anaheim called Euclid. Yeah, that's true. I don't know if it's named after the mathematician like this so. mission is, um, but you know it could possibly <laughs> be it. But the, we got a little bit of bad news coming from the European Space Agency. Yeah. Not uh, well. Bad news, but also good news sure. as well at the same time um, with it, which it seems like when you make a space telescope, you often run into problems and you end up having to delay it because of instruments or something with it. And that's often because a lot of these instruments we're designing for space telescopes, nobody's ever designed anything like it before. So sure. custom one-off, special order, if you will. So right. it's, it's always pushing the boundaries of what we can do um, with astronomy. Um, but the European Space Agen Agency's upcoming Euclid Dark Matter uh, Seeking Space telescope it's not an exception to this uh, this rule it oh. seems of space telescopes being delayed so it was originally scheduled to launch in 2020 and the delay is looking to be about 12 months after this and it's actually related to the instruments that are going to be flown on the telescope specifically this instrument that we have in view for you right here which is a near infrared spectrometer problems have arisen when they were taken down to their operational temperatures as a infrared system has to be significantly colder than the objects you're trying to view in order to actually see them. So Euclid is an awesome mission because it is designed to view 2 billion galaxies simultaneously back as far as 10 billion light years. And it's going to cover roughly one third of what we call, what us astronomers call the extra galactic sky. So this is basically the sky that's facing away from the Milky Way. So if you try to look through the Milky Way, obviously the Milky Way kind of blocks your view. So mm -hmm. we really like to do super precise studies not looking through the Milky Way, so we look out of the Milky Way, uh, and we call that the extra galactic sky. Now, uh, we actually should be able to characterize the interaction of dark matter with regular what we call baryonic matter, which is what you and I and, and the computer or whatever you're watching this um, on are made out of. Uh, and we might even be able to crack some of the secrets of dark energy with this as well. Hmm. And that's because it's got a super wide field of view. It can look at a big patch of the sky all at once. And it's very, very awesome mission. So, And it's good that they caught this on the ground. Yeah. As opposed to like being out there, because this is going to the the uh, Earth, uh, the Sun, Earth, Lagrangian point two. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, um, good. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> you, good you, that we caught it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm trying to so, go for. Yeah. Oh goodness, <laughs> it's just one of those. It's one of those days, apparently. Um, yes. You know, actually, there was a question in the chat room. I don't know if you'll be able to answer uh, mm -hmm. from YouTube. Jim Burr, uh, again, uh, how cold are they planning on to get these instruments? Uh, I actually don't know precisely how cold uh, the the uh, infrared systems on Euclid are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you on James Webb, they're going down to 40 Kelvin, which is... That's extremely cold. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's cold. Um, so... Very cold because yeah. you know. <laughs> I mean, I yes, mean, yes, it is. <laughs> it sounds really silly, but but if you want to see something that's at like 45 Kelvin, mm -hmm. you with an infrared instrument, you need to drop it down to below 45 Kelvin, and that's that's basically how it works because okay, you're not sure. going to be able to detect it because your detector itself will be brighter right, than you the object difference. you're trying to look at. So, um, so it's very important that we make it super cold. So I'm not sure of the exact temperature, but I will tell you, it's, it's with infrared instruments, it's usually super cold, like uh, like double digit. Kelvin uh, temperatures. So, okay. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I know, Jared, you uh, are going to be conducting an interview with Chris Prophet mm -hmm. uh, about SpaceX, about the future of SpaceX. Yes. Uh, but Mike, 
about the here and now of SpaceX. You've got a story. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, so it sounds like SpaceX and the Air Force are getting cozy, huh? Yeah. Um, well, the Air Force, of course, has their evolved expendable launch vehicle program, and SpaceX has been, you know, trying to be a part of that, and have been trying to get authorized to to launch national security payloads. But so has Orbital ATK, or rather, Orbital ATK is Space Division of Northrop Grumman. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> a couple of contracts. <laughs> but okay back up a couple of months ago the air force uh put out a, a, a couple of contract awards that was uh giving out money to develop new rocket systems for the eelv program mm -hmm. evolved expendable launch vehicle program and over this past week they've given some extended contracts to spacex and orbital atk now, for SpaceX, the uh, um, contract extension is about $40 million to help develop their Raptor methane engine. Mm. And with this, the funding uh, um, is an extension that they got $33 million originally, and SpaceX agreed to, to spend about $67 million uh, to jointly fund this program. And this is not the exact Raptor engine that they're going to be using on their big BFR. This is going to be a subscale demo that they're going to use first on the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets. Now, back on June 8th of this year, the Air Force added, uh, a, 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 this is actually the second extension. The first extension they did was $16.8 million. And the ceiling at that time was about $95 million that they could invest in this program. Now, uh, aside from the uh, uh, the... Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy demos, of course, this is going to carry right on over to the BFR program as well. So everything that they're able to learn from this is going to uh, apply towards that program. But not only is it going to work for that, but if SpaceX and the Air Force have some sort of program where they want to keep that subscale demo, that might be a part of the EELV program. And mm. this all, of course, is to, uh, to re get away from the dependence on the Russian RD-180 engines used on United Launch Alliance's Atlas Five. Right. And the Raptor isn't under considerment as a replacement for that. It's just that the Air Force wants as many options as they can. Now, uh, SpaceX is, of course, going to be performing their work um, for this program at its headquarters, headquarters in Hawthorne, California. They're also going to be doing some testing at the NASA Stennis Space Center in Mississippi and, of course, at the Los Angeles Air Force Base. But Let's talk about Orbital ATK for a minute. The Air Force has awarded them an additional $20 million for advanced rocket technology and solid boost technology. Now, this is a, uh, it's kind of a weird contract. It's an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. It's a hybrid cost plus, but fixed fee and fixed firm price contract. I know that sounds confusing, but it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. If there are overruns, they could add more money, but they want this, if they can, to be an affordable fixed price contract. But what it is, is, is it's going to be doing uh, research at the Air Force working on aerospace systems and rocket propulsion division and they're looking at more solid rocket motors to address you know their next generation strategic tactical and spacecraft propulsion systems and it sounds to me that this is more likely going to be for some of orbital ATK's smaller military applications like missiles mm. but most likely it could also be to develop another ICBM to enhance or replace the aging fleet of ICBMs that you know orbital ATK supplies under the Minuteman program or even the Polaris rockets. So anyway, there's one other thing that they're working on that could be a part of the EELV program, the next generation launcher that Orbital ATK has been working on and has been getting funding from the Air Force for. Either way, it sounds like that this is really good for both companies and that uh, it's going to be beneficial for the Air Force, too. And there could be some really exciting space projects that result from this. So I know it's just a, a contract and, and uh, just money being passed around, but I'm excited for what it could bring. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, gosh, you know, I just saw it and now I lost it. But somebody in the chat room was asking about um, if Raptor engines, there we are. Uh, wonder why Raptor's not being considered for the Vulcan uh, rocket. Can you speak to that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> well, considering that SpaceX and United Launch Alliance are competitors, um, and I mean Blue Origin's competitors with them too, kinda, but I doubt that 
SpaceX would seek that out. And even if they did, I doubt that United Launch Alliance would even consider them for that. But that's just my own personal opinion. I mean, miracles can happen, and, and who knows? Maybe that is the uh, other secret you know, uh, alternative that United Launch Alliance has been considering for Vulcan other than Blue Origins engines or Aerojet Rocket 9's engines. Who knows? But um, I don't think that that would ever be likely. Okay, so to be clear, uh, SpaceX makes the Raptor engine, and uh, United Launch Alliance makes the Vulcan rocket, and that's why those two would not necessarily uh, plug and play. Yeah. Yeah. And the primary <laughs> engine that they want to use for the uh, Vulcan rocket is Blue Origin's BE-4 methane engine. Mm. So it would be very similar to the Raptor in, in a sense, although they have different specifics. Um, but Aerojet Rocketdyne's engine would be kind of the more traditional uh, RP-1, rocket propellant one, and uh, liquid oxygen. So we'll see how things go. And that's what the Atlas V rocket uses now. So it's either going to be a bigger, better Atlas V, or it's going to be a, a methane-based rocket. We'll see. Gotcha. Yeah, I'd say the, the I, I just, you know, throwing a spitball out there, if mm -hmm. you will. Probably the, you know, the business... Uh, the ultimate business goals are probably ra uh, radically different too, since ULA wants to focus on lunar space, and SpaceX's ultimate goal is is people on Mars. Oh yeah, so. they're just going to different yeah. places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, that uh, that yeah. answers that, option, I suppose. So. All right, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to take a, a calendar break, as it were, and look at all of those launches that mm -hmm. are coming up. Can't wait to get Mike to uh, dance for us next week, and then uh, Jared's <laughs> going to set up for his interview with Chris Prophet about the future of SpaceX. Stay with us. There's more tomorrow coming right back. And welcome back after that launch calendar break. Now, before we get into our interview segment for today's Tomorrow Show, I first would like to give a huge shout out to our patrons of Tomorrow, of our Escape Velocity variety. These folks give us $10 or more per episode. And if you would like to hear everything that you get as an Escape Velocity uh, Patreon supporter, head on back to the beginning of the show and listen to Carrie Ann rattle off everything because it's amazing. In addition to that, we also have our Orbital patrons. These folks give us $5 or more per show. They get their name in the show during this segment, in our comments segment, access to exclusive Patreon-only hangouts, early access to After Dark, early access to a view-only copy of the show rundown, free worldwide shipping for the Tomorrow Swag Store, read-only access to the Tomorrow Host chat channel. That's a future reward, letting you know a little bit there, and voting rights on upcoming roundtable discussions. So if you would like to help crowd fund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to Patreon. Dot com slash T-M-R-O. And I'm very excited about today's show because just a few shows ago, we talked about the history of SpaceX and we learned some things, uh, like there were different rockets and other stuff with that. But today, we have Chris Prophet, the author of SpaceX from the Ground Up, who is going to be talking to us today about the future of SpaceX. Chris, welcome to Station 204. Hi, uh, glad to be here. Uh, great show. I uh, usually watch it every week. Awesome. Well, now, you, now you're here, and we're going to talk to you about the future of SpaceX. And, of course, uh, the future is, is coming, uh, but the, the present often influences uh, the future of, uh, of what we may be doing in, in space and sciences uh, with that. So what are some of the things uh, that SpaceX is doing right now uh, that, are, that are precursors for some of the work that will be occurring in the future? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, everybody knows about the point-to-point uh, -point transit uh, project they've got running at the moment I feel that is going to be very important uh, for their future it, it, it seems a little bit of a diversion really that they're doing point to point they're flying to Shanghai or uh, Honolulu or wherever where, where the corporate goal is to get to Mars but uh, uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX has this philosophy where I, they look at projects, they look to see how uh, they can 
do something that's worthwhile, meaningful, going to grant some benefit to everybody, make a business out of it, and uh, the money they generate, they can uh, use that to fulfill their or, or, or present opportunities to achieve their longer term goals. Now, that point to point transit, as I say, it seems like a diversion. Why are they going to Honolulu when they want to go to Mars? But if you look at the system uh, they're, they're projected to deploy, uh, they want to put down these uh, floating spaceports, which are a little bit like the ASDS, the uh, landing barges they use, but on a grander scale. Now, they're going to put those down in various strategic points around the world. That's uh, going to be really helpful for people for getting to A to B. But once every 26 months, when Earth and Mars align, they will have a number of launch sites all the way around the world. One thing they need uh, to do this uh, Mars run is lots of launch sites and uh, lots of launches, basically. Uh, you can take off a passenger spacecraft from anywhere around the world, but you need another four uh, tankers to refill it to make sure it can get it can reach Mars. Now, <clears throat> so one, they'll have the launch sites already in place. It had been paid for by uh, normal commercial operations. Also, they'll have an awful lot of uh, BFR passengers type craft, so they can just take the passengers out of that launch it empty but with a full tank of fuel they can fly up refill the uh, refill the passenger bfr that are heading towards mars so they've got the launch sites and they've got the tanker craft and they haven't had to pay for any of it it's all been uh, sort of harvested from normal com commercial operations yeah there might be like intermission between uh, normal sort of point to point transit but it's all reasoned and reasonable and well if they're not going to get any support from anybody outside the company which there's pros and cons with that it, it can be done uh, it's it's very insightful I, i'm surprised uh, a few people in the press might not have picked up on that but you've got to really look inside the way uh, they work that is everything's commercial Everything has a reason, and they have a, it has a, a short-term goal to provide some benefit, and a long-term goal, which is Mars, basically. Well, that's my perspective, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I've got sort of a, a question about point-to-point -point that I'm going to throw to you, and I, I don't know whether you'll have the answer for something like this or not. Um, but with with the BFR uh, and the, the spacecraft, specifically with point-to-point, -point, is SpaceX looking at that as a supplier, like Boeing is, where Boeing will build a 787 Dreamliner for a company? or are they going to be the, the supplier slash company to get you, uh, you know, the transport company there? Hmm. Well, I can only go on uh, their past uh, like performance. People have come to them in the past. Uh, SES, I, I believe, after they had their stage land, they, they mooted, they asked whether they could like keep the stage because they paid for it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So, in any case, SpaceX said, well, no, actually, you've effectively just hired it for one launch. You know, you, you, you pay for the launch service. It belongs to us, but we, we uh, operate it, and we'll gladly use it again to launch one of your satellites. But we can't guarantee it'll be that stage. It, we, we sort of, it's like the, uh, the shell game. It could be any stage, whatever we have <laughs> available at the time, basically. So, uh, no, I believe... It, it's just too. It's just too critical. If you can imagine, they're they're operating these uh, strategic uh, landing sites, floating landing sites around the world, and just to say, oh, all right, well, uh, there's a there's a guy in Shanghai who would like to take over operation, and he says he'll do a great job, and yeah, it'll be it, that landing crate will be open and ready, and the fuel will be all ready to go as soon as you land. You don't have to worry about it. He's he's uh, he's provided us, you know, a good internet degree certificate. No, <laughs> they're going to want to do that work themselves because the whole the whole operation is just so critical. Uh, it's their baby, and and these sites are going to be strategically important for them in the future. I mean, it's not just technically important. Uh, if you think about it, the uh, SpaceX are planning on sending millions of people. Elon was saying during the week that they want 
that's the only way they're going to have industry working on Mars. They need millions of people there. Now, they can either take, what's that, one in every 15 Americans uh, out of the population and fly them to Mars, or, or you can take them from all the way around the world. Uh, and, <laughs> oh, they just have, have uh, launch sites suitable for BFR, situated all the way around the world. I mean, some of these people they're going to take, it's like offering an olive branch to uh, China and Russia and say, well, look, I know we've been sort of going on our own to do this uh, Mars run, but uh, we, we could help you if you want to. You can participate. Uh, you can send your, send your people out to your local spaceport or take off from them and that will solve the problem about how to get them from A to B. I mean, some of those people they, they get from, say, China, they might be nuclear experts, rocket scientists, submarine specialists. Now, these are all people. They're probably not going to want to be to travel to the American mainland. So if they can have a nice ceremony, a uh, waving off ceremony on the beach and they get on a local spaceport, well, that's all to the good. Uh, that, that's, that's certainly going to help with international uh, diplomacy and uh, space exploration. As far as I can see, the whole thing is, is very well integrated. Um, it's no wonder Elon seemed to be you know, well, well chuffed about the idea because, well, it's, it's, it's big. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about the international aspect uh, uh, of it with, with, with relations between countries uh, with that. So we've got, uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in from the chat room, and we're just going to go straight into them. Uh, the first one comes from Lur, uh, which is that the launch window to Mars is open every 26 months or so, and they need to give BFR something to do during the downtime. Um, so I guess to kind of take that and modify that into a, a question, um, what is BFR, besides point to point, going to be doing in that downtime between Mars launch windows? You can do anything. Uh, as uh, Ben was saying, um, sorry, Space Mike? Yeah, <laughs> Space Mike, get his name right. Uh, it can fly to low Earth orbit, you fuel it back up again, you can send it to the moon, the moon. You can come back from the moon without refueling. So, you know, you want to set up a, a lunar colony? Fine. I, I know Europeans are very interested in setting up a, a village up there, a, a, a lunar village. Uh, th there's a lot of the uh, things which actually generate money are Earth-centric at the moment. So it, it's the ideal vessel, 150 tons if you if you do it re reusable to low Earth orbit possibility to send it to uh, cislunar space i mean you want to do anything you want with it. it it's it's got that capability i mean one thing i i particularly uh, think would be a big possibility is that uh military the air force however you want to like uh, style them they're, they're very interested in this uh, next generation launch vehicle the, the another another uh, EELV uh, vehicle, basically. Now, <clears throat> they must miss some of the capabilities from space shuttle, i.e. sending crew to space, retrieving satellites, launching satellites sort of quietly, <laughs> <laughs> shall we say. Uh, and BFR is like a, a, a space shuttle on steroids. It's 150 tons to low Earth orbit. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, they're also talking about forming a uh, a space core, mm -hmm. uh, separating all the space uh, operations and making it like uh, the Marines are to the Navy. Again, this this vehicle is just slow plumb down the middle for what they what they need. Um, what, what can I say? I think it's going to be very, very busy, uh, especially if they're going to launch like 12,000 satellites uh, for a low, low Earth orbit uh, constellation, their internet constellation. Really, uh, I, I don't think they're going to want for uh, applications for it, one little bit, basically. Uh, so, so capable, so very capable. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking of that internet constellation, we actually have a question from the chat room um, about about that uh, in relations to BFR from Ron Smith 3, uh, which is that will SpaceX need BFR to build out its internet constellation or will the constellation pay for BFR? Well, uh, when uh, Elon launched the Seattle operation, he said that what they were doing would pay for a city on Mars. So obviously at that time, 
uh, I, I believe he was uh, projecting that he could pay for BFR out of normal operations. That's what he certainly implied at, uh, at the IAC in Adelaide. I mean, they, I, I sort of detail the finances uh, in the book. They seem to make quite a good deal of money, basically. Uh, NASA, NASA work pay, uh, pays to keep the lights on, so any ma money they make from commercial operations, launching, you know, for satellites, it's just uh, disposable income, basically, and they have quite a, quite a good deal. The only sort of thing that might be a problem is that they're doing that big internet satellite uh, constellation and they're building the BFR at the same time so uh, I believe he said they're gonna have to do a little bit of creative uh, finances but I don't know how far you want to go into that but uh, there are plenty of options for them but it's gonna be tight uh, in these next few years and uh, BFR really can't come online uh, soon enough because of the capability uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and Sarge Enzyme uh, in our in our chat room has a has a question about the capability of uh, BFR, which is what about building the next space station? And I would say that yeah, definitely, considering everything that you've you've just said uh, about the capabilities of BFR. And it, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 uh, next space station. I mean, it, it is a space station. Have you seen it? Have you seen the picture of it, Doctor? The ISS. It's like yeah, <laughs> it's big. And yeah, we were we were talking about you know you could literally put instruments all over the place on with the interior volume that it has. You should be able to put a ton of instruments in there and, and carry the people. Um, I mean, why, do you, why do you need a station when you've got something that can go any anywhere in uh, <laughs> this lunar area? I mean, with, it is the with station. A, a better yeah. instrumentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a station that just happens to have a, a lot of uh, a very high thrust to weight ratio um, and uh, a mm -hmm. little bit of a cross range <laughs> capability when it returns. Yeah. So, who, reusable or, space or stations. Try. Who would have thunk, huh? <laughs> um, so, also from the chat room as well, Lur has a has a, another question, which are: Are there any partners for the Internet Satellite Network? Because um, I've seen some really cool discussions about this uh, on Twitter this week uh, from some people that I follow. Uh, but are are there any partners for that Internet Satellite? network at the moment? There are none declared at the moment, as far as I know. But the potential partners is every internet uh, service provider everywhere, because this is like a backbone service they're operating. You can, uh, you can send stuff through space faster than you can through a normal optical, optical cable under the ocean, however you want to do it. This is going to be, they're talking about big data transfer that's that's going to be a, a, a big money earner of course yes everybody in the world will be able to have uh, internet at a very low latency you know what one one, uh, one terabit uh, transfer rate uh, so yeah they could they could uh, essentially compete with isps but the, the probably uh, the the existing ones in the in the urban areas they're just gonna say well look you know if you want to communicate with another urban area don't have to lay a cable just uplink to us and we'll we'll however much data you want to shift we we've got the capacity it's all the internet is now in space <laughs> yeah, if, I <laughs> the backbone. if i remember right uh the the maiden flight of uh, the the uh 1.1 version of falcon 9 flew uh cassiope which was an experiment by the canadian space agency to do exactly that um so pretty interesting uh <laughs> that's coming full circle with their ideas. Um, so obviously the, the end game uh, for SpaceX is, is people on Mars and not just people on Mars, lots of people on Mars. Um, that's sort of what I feel like separates them uh, from other companies looking at going at Mars. Um, and uh, with, what does the pathway to that look like? Um, because that's not, that's not particularly, it's not what I call a easy pathway uh, to take that. What, what, ki what kind of uh, uh, things are going to occur along the way to make that happen? Well, uh, <clears throat> obviously, Raptor engine is really important, as you were discussing earlier. I mean, it's as though SpaceX has reached into the future and poured an engine out of the future. I mean, the Raptor engine is, a, is I can't uh, express how important it is because <clears throat> A rocket development, it's it sort of turns on the on the engine. If you have the engine, well, the rest of the rocket is not so hard. Uh, I mean, that engine should really not be with us until about uh, 2050, because it, it's it's an engine which allows you to go from from Earth 
to land to Mars, refuel with uh, <laughs> with perhaps lower grade uh, propellant, ISRU, <laughs> uh, methane and oxygen, and then come back to Earth all without an overhaul. I mean, that's massive. In the in the past, those those engines have just been uh, fire for two, three minutes and then chuck them in the ocean. The difference that makes, I mean, it's only when you sort of say, OK, we need to start colonizing Mars, that you even think about putting an engine together like that. And that's been operating on the test stand for the last year, essentially, and op operating well. I mean, I like the way that as soon as they put it on the test stand, it worked and it didn't just do a blip test it ran for quite an extensive amount of time you know it, it's just reliable which is just what they need uh, what other technologies we're going to need ah, <laughs> a lot <laughs> but uh the, elon doesn't sort of say all right i'm just going to do this and and focus and, and there's nothing uh, and everything else is going to have to be sorted out later on or by somebody else no he, he, he thinks with rather a wide vision i mean there's various things that are being done i understand they're looking into nuclear nuclear propulsion which is all going to be useful for mars because when that sandstorms uh blow as they do quite regular those solar cells are going to be pretty much useless yeah they're going to have some capacity in the batteries i mean let's just look at it solar cells could be supplied by uh, by uh, Tesla or Solar City. Uh, you know they're part of Tesla now. The uh, the high storage capacity batteries, again, Solar City, Tesla, uh, all train vehicles for Mars, Tesla. <laughs> uh, <coughs> you, you you need uh, you need to have uh, burrowing machines to excavate the water on Mars, all right? Because it's all frozen underground. So, I mean, oh, where are they going to get that from? If they look out the window at SpaceX, there's a there's a big tunneling machine out there in the car park. You know, where, <laughs> where's it coming from? It, it's all coming from now, basically. Uh, you need lots and lots of robots on Mars because you've got a real shortage of uh, labor there, manpower. So, <clears throat> where, where's the uh, AI going to come from? Oh. Uh, open AI. There's a company that Elon has just started called Open AI, where they're going to put together an open source artificial intelligence program. Things are moving forwards. I mean, habitats, people say, oh, well, what about the habitats? But the habitats are just geostationary, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, geodomes, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, geodesic domes. And if you look at the first uh, design of the ITS, They've got the, around half of the face is, is covered by a, a, a geodesic dome. So they're obviously going to test out the, the technology in the ITS. If it works, which I'm sure it probably will, they'll just make those, uh, they'll just have the dome go all the way around and, and, and uh, packed up, flat packed inside the, inside the BFR and wheeled out deployed uh, when they need it so things are happening yeah uh, he's not sort of leaving it up to chance i believe he's even been talking to a group uh, arizona university about uh, closed uh, closed system uh, ecosystems where you basically uh, recycle everything because that's what you, you can't uh, waste anything when you're on mars everything's a resource if you bring something you want to you want to get the maximum work out of it so it's it's all happening, but it's happening behind the scenes. So I try and describe a little bit about that uh, in my writing. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions about that? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Duco from our chat room has a question, uh, which is asking: Will we see a Mars crew orbit Earth for half a year or more before going to Mars? So, I, I just kind of want to expand that a little bit to what is, what are the general operations of a of a typical SpaceX Mars mission? What do you think they would end up looking like? Well, uh, we know the first one uh, is probably going to be up to about 12 people. Those are going to be some pretty hard-working engineers, maybe split across two ships. Uh, that was the original plan with the ITS. But as far as I can see, they'll launch these uh, rockets from where, wherever, Shanghai, Los Angeles, whatever. They'll go up, then straight away it'll be refueled and then refueled and then refueled because all the time those uh, people you can have up to 100 people on, on board 
all the time they're there. They're devouring the food supplies, uh, eating into the EC, LSS, you know, the life support system. So they want to get, and also the fuels uh, boiling off. Oxygen, methane, it's just boiling off. So uh, they need to get it up there, refueled as quickly as possible on its way to Mars. And then hopefully they can fit in like two, three, or even four, you know, in, in, in every window. But they have to do it quick. And that's what they want, need to look the multiple launch sites for and the multiple tankers because yeah it's great having a having a a bfr where you can turn around in 24 hours but that might be too long they might need to do it faster than that there is they want to have those tankers just literally lining up ready to dock and just plug in and then plug and play scoot to mars uh, that, that's how i uh, perceive it's going to go down i can't see any reason why not because they get to mars and oh uh, they managed to survive for 20, 26 months, and they and they just haven't got enough food for the last day. Well, no, if they if they go sooner, they go. The more food they have, the the uh, more chance they have of survival. So, uh, I think it's going to be a very quick sort of turnaround. But yeah, they can easily sort of fly out to the moon, do long long loops around it, test it out. They'll definitely go out on a shakedown cruise before they go <laughs> all the way to Mars. <laughs> they'll want to yeah. make sure that uh, closed loop ecosystem or whatever it is they're using on board, it's probably just going to be a normal uh, sort of e e eaten uh, and collect uh, sort of operation. <laughs> yeah, there's so there's no uh, there's going to be no STS-1 uh, all up gut check uh, flight with, the, <laughs> with a system like this. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so from YouTube, we have a comment from JC seven seven nine seven two three um which is when do you think the normal joe or jane will be able to take a space trip um so with with spacex when do you think that's going to be possible well i mean this is uh, the idea behind the point to point essentially uh, in uh they say they're going to have that together in 20, 2020 they're going to start doing uh suborbital hops I mean, again, it's just part of a very big, uh, a big strategy. If you can get people going on those flights, I mean, you could say, "All oh, right, well, I will get on the uh, BFR from Los Angeles to uh, Tokyo, and then have a nice proper sushi meal, see some sumo, come back in the same evening." <laughs> that gets people sort of mindful. Uh, well, you know, it's not so bad in space uh, all, all these people who've got a bit of money <laughs> although it's supposed to be it's the same amount as a, as a normal economy fair ticket so, so next decade I, I, I put it down for uh, and those people once they get used to space travel they think well we might maybe go a little bit further go to Mars have a holiday on Mars <laughs> yeah might as well so not yeah. just, so total recall won't just be a movie for uh, for much longer uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll bring that on pretty soon um, and then for the final one I'm going to pull from the chat room today is uh, Kajitin uh, that's a tough one to pronounce I'll just say uh, K um, which is uh, what do you think Falcon Heavy maiden flight in December or slip to 2018 it's Sort of the the thing that everybody's been focusing on recently. So what do you what do you see in your your crystal ball uh, of the future with uh, with Falcon Heavy? Uh, so hard to call because uh, I can almost hear Elon saying we have to launch this year. He wanted to go in November. December is a, is a slip that he might be able to accept. But they really need to get that rocket off its tail. And show the uh, the customers that it's it's viable. I mean, specifically the Air Force, who are very interested in that high uh, payload. You know, maybe even uh, have it in direct injection to uh, Geo. Yeah. It's rare, but uh, you've got a big rocket like that. You can go anywhere. Uh, so they really. <laughs> I mean, that said, I I, I mean uh, I'd love to see it this year. But realistically, considering the amount of uh, technical uh, challenges, they've got to get the pad together. They've got to test the boosters. They'll probably test them individually uh, and then all together. I think it's going to slip. I mean, people that want to go, <laughs> they want to have a Christmas. <laughs> yeah. They want to... <laughs> yeah, I think it was fine. I think it's it. going to slip in January. Uh, that's just my opinion. I'd love to see it go before then. Yeah, it was Feynman who said, uh, "For nature cannot be fooled." So uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, mm. We'll see what happens with that there. So. 
Chris, we have got five standard questions that we ask everyone at the end of our interviews. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers to these. Just tell us what you think. Um, tell us as much as you think uh, about it as well. So here are our five questions that we always ask everybody. Our first one, moon or Mars first? Uh, moon, so that uh, SpaceX can get more money to go to Mars. <laughs> they just drop off some math. Some NASA guys there and say, there you go, you're on your own now. Yeah. And uh, just sign the check. So long and <laughs> thanks fine. for all the cash. Uh, so, yeah. um, for space, would you go? Uh, oh, I'm already there. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Oh. Right. Well, uh, we all know it's the 2024 launch window, landing in 2025, maybe. Oh, <laughs> uh, again, I think it'll probably slip. It's just I, I'm going to be optimistic and, and, and say, you know, uh, 2027, something like that. Okay. Because they've just got so much work. <laughs> Yeah. so much and now they've got the international point to point sumo sort of thing and uh, and or oh, elon will want have his uh, own private rocket fly from los angeles to shanghai <laughs> because he's opening he, he's, he's opening a new uh, tesla factory in shanghai so he won't want to uh, you know muck in with the economy on the class on the, <laughs> yeah. on the normal aircraft <laughs> yeah i'm sure he'll just step out of the office to the hawthorne airport and they'll launch it from right there so um when, well, do, you, yeah. when, when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again oh relatively soon i'd, I'd have thought uh definitely before the middle of the next uh, decade if you got the bfr why not uh, it's it's an obvious point of call like elon said itself if you've got a if you've got an ocean liner that can go from the uh, america to britain i mean why not go from britain to france just across the channel it's it's no it's no hassle and none, none whatsoever it's uh, in fact it's quite expected i think just to uh, give it a shakedown mm -hmm. yeah and then our final question which is also my favorite one which is why space why space oh right H -h how long have you got <laughs> uh, long, oh go uh, ahead just is, roll with it yeah okay all right uh, at the moment we, we're sort of an interesting place it, it, it seems to me where we are at the moment is in a new renaissance. Um, uh, we were sort of very sort of stuck uh, where we were. We believed only government could do stuff uh, or very, very big industries. But after, after uh, Silicon Valley, no, we've, we worked out the best way of doing things is small groups of individuals working tirelessly. They can really put stuff together. Now, in uh, history tends to repeat itself. So, after Renaissance, you have the age of uh, discovery. Now, all the technologies we, we've developed in, in, in this new Renaissance age is going to lead us to space. Uh, when we get to space, we get to Mars, we find out new stuff, find out new challenges. Everything's new on Mars. Everything's a challenge. They can't just uh, send out for parts uh, because it's going to be 26 months. They need to get new technologies together to solve new problems and fi uh, finding ways of fixing things. So straight away, that forces the development of a, a, a new industrial age. They probably won't even call it industrial age. They call it something like the, 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 the quantum revolution, you know, instead of the industrial revolution. And, and these technologies, they'll come back to us. We'll, we'll, we'll enhance them and send it back out to space. You know, uh, this, this all, uh, humans uh, do best when they, when they face challenges. And there's nothing more challenging than going to Mars or, or opening up colonies anywhere else, you know, just, just in space. It, it, it's it's what we need. Uh, we've got a little bit stultified. We've started to break out of it with this new, with uh, Silicon Valley, the new information age. But we need a push. We need to complete the cycle, get all the way through to that next uh, industrial revolution where things get really, really interesting. AI and neural dust, you know, where you can have direct interfaces from your brain to uh, via an AI to other people's AIs and neural dust and uh, quantum computing communications via qu via quantum entanglement so it's zero sort of time all that stuff it comes from space but the main the main benefit i can see for us 
in space at the moment is that if we start going out into space we become more outward looking so uh, I mean the dinosaurs died because they didn't have a space program <laughs> <You know? laughs> how much more reason do you need than that basically <laughs> <laughs> all right Chris Prophet thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today thank you <laughs> okay oh Glad to be here, and uh, good questions. <laughs> yeah, thanks again. So, coming up after this segment, your comments. There's more tomorrow right after this. You look down from orbit from 240 miles, 240 nautical miles, and, you know, there, there are no boundary lines on, on uh, the ground. And I just thought, and I know I wasn't original that it's been proposed before, that uh, heaven political discussions regarding country incursions on another country's uh, property or, or that, you know, could be better handled by being in orbit. And you can see that it's, it's just part of our blue and green ball. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from our last show, I did want to give a shout-out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this episode. They're Escape Velocity patrons. We also have our Orbital patrons who have contributed $5 or more, as well as our Suborbital patrons who have contributed $2.50 or more. Every single dollar helps. Every single patron helps. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And if you can't become a patron or that's not really your thing, that's, that's cool too. Simply subscribe to the show on YouTube. That will help out a great deal. All right, let's get started with some comments from last week's show. Uh, Capcom, what did we have last week? Uh, we had John Amabile, author of Changing the Worlds, mm. plural. Mm, plural. Just in case. Uh, yep. You know, and uh, yeah, you guys had a lot of comments. <laughs> about, yes, quite a few. Uh, about this one. Uh, the first one actually comes off of Patreon, as mentioned before, from Tarantula saying, This approach to colonization seems to be very confident in capitalist models. Of course, profits will drive the most ambitious efforts. Moon from 2009 seems very apt, uh, the movie we're talking about there. Yet, with humans gone, where there'll be, will there be hope for robots? Uh, Space Mike, I'll throw that one to you. Well, I'm not sure that I understand this question uh, correctly. I mean, with humans gone, will there be hope for robots? I mean, if uh, artificial intelligence gets developed, then sure, why not? It'll just multiply indefinitely like the Borg or something like that. But I think that you are right that profits are what's going to drive us expanding out into space for at least the beginning. Hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I mean... For those of you who haven't seen the movie Moon, I really do suggest that you uh, do go out and see it. It uh, centers around, uh, uh, there's some mining going on on the moon, and uh, mostly robots are doing it, but they mm -hmm. have to have one human to kind of take care of the robots, mm -hmm. as it were. Uh, and then there's one extra uh, AI that's kind of taking care of the human uh, named Gertie. That's what our car is named after. That's what our car is named after. Uh, there you go. A, it is a really good movie <laughs> if you haven't seen it. Uh, Sam Rockwell does a great job. I, I think a lot of people had issues with the capitalist side of this mm. on 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 the channel, and I, I I think there's something to be said for making money. You can't just like you, we we can hope for a um, Star Trekian kind of view of the future where money is no longer required, but mm -hmm. that is not the world in which we live right now. Mm -hmm. And if we want to make great things happen right now on on time frames that are within our lifetime, we have to work within the confi confines of what society is used to, and that means it will be capitalist. So, I mean, that's not truly what this comment was touching on, sure. but I mean, I think touching on some of the other comments uh, mm -hmm. uh, that were yeah. there at that list. Okay, uh, next comment comes off of YouTube from Attic Land. Uh, this sounds an awful like the kind of expletive project that would lean to an expanse-like future. Expanse, a great TV show. If you haven't seen that, go ahead and see that in sci-fi. Uh, <laughs> where humanity has gotten to lots of places and has gotten much done in space, but everything is based off of driven by endless greed. Not a great adventure with quote-unquote high ambitions like NASA or Musk Envision. Not sure what to think of that. Um, kind of like you were saying, I suppose, a little bit. Uh, I, I think even if money itself very specifically is not involved, there's going to be some sort of bartering kind of system. Mm -hmm. uh, there just simply has to be. Yeah. 
not everyone is going to magically get along and everyone's going to love each other. It's going to be like, hey, uh, I noticed you have those fruits and vegetables and I happen to have cows and goats. How about a swap? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like, and then, you know, yeah. so it doesn't have to be money specifically, but sure. I, I think any sort of, uh, you know, sometimes people look towards Burning Man, for instance, for, for a good sort of like, oh, it's just peace and love and everything's amazing. Sure, but there's still some bartering going on. If mm -hmm. I have fresh water, you have baked goods, you want a shower, I want to eat something. Cool. And then and then there's a system that, that just naturally occurs inside of uh, that sort of uh, grouping, if you will. And so I think, like you were saying, I think, yes, sometimes it sounds like a bad capitalist evil, like only greedy, only for money sort of situation. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is somebody is going to have something that you're going to want. You're going to have something that somebody else is going to want. And when the two of you meet, you are going to figure out some kind of system uh, of exchange. Yeah. And I think that's really more uh, what this is going towards. And then sometimes that just happens to be about money. Yeah. And in space flight, it's going to be especially amplified because sometimes that exchange may be for life-saving stuff. You know, like we need, you know, uh, ten, uh, 10 more kilograms of oxygen in order to operate the base for a certain amount of time. Uh, how do we get that, you know, kind of thing. Sure. So, yeah. All right, let's do one more comment, Capcom. Uh, sure. Uh, it says, uh, this one comes from Luke off of YouTube. It says, I don't think this guest has any idea what he's talking about, <laughs> and it's quite clear Ben is uncomfortable having the conversation with him. Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry that I gave off, uh, uh, I, I don't... Uh, to be fair, I, Ben's always uncomfortable. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I feel so. like I'm uncomfortable right now, just in yeah. my own skin. <laughs> um, I, I didn't mean to come off as looking uncomfortable or being uncomfortable having a conversation. I certainly did push back with certain things where... Um, uh, you, you know, and anything where the physics didn't seem to quite line up or like um, the velocities involved weren't quite right. Like the, the numbers yeah. weren't, if the numbers weren't closing, I was certainly pushing back on that because numbers aren't closing. Um, I, I think the, the, it's only impossible until it isn't. Landing rockets is a stupid and terrible idea. You don't have the payload margin to do it. No one's ever done it before. We tried it with the space shuttle. It was super stupid expensive with that. Landing rockets is stupid. Until it isn't. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it, it's easy to look at ideas like this and go, oh, that's way too ambitious. I don't, I don't get that. None of this makes any sense. Until it does. So I don't like to judge ideas based on anything other than the, the physics and the math behind them uh, from that regard. And I'm human, so exceptions to that rule. <laughs> but, right, I mean, if the numbers don't close, I'll push back on that. But if you have an idea, just because it's different, just because it looks at things differently, I'm not going to say that that's a bad idea or that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to, I would love to give you the benefit of the doubt and hope that uh, that idea comes to fruition. Much like that week's guest, and that is the idea that I like to convey, which is, look, he has an idea as to how to colonize the solar system in our lifetime. And even if some of the numbers don't close, let's, instead of going, that's a stupid idea, let's not do that, let's help him close the numbers. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. in, instead of, blah, it's easy to just be on the internet and be like, blah, bad idea. It's much harder to go, okay, well, those numbers don't close. How about this? Would this help you close that gap? Uh, I think that's a much more useful use of energy than just, blah, blah sucky idea. By the way, just in general. I think mm -hmm. that's just a general life tip. Uh, so that was my takeaway. It wasn't, this is a bad idea. I wasn't uncomfortable, uh, and, and I didn't feel like it was not achievable. I think some of those ideas were very aggressive. <laughs> quite aggressive. <laughs> I think some of those timelines are quite aggressive, but you know what? I can say that about a lot of new space companies that set timelines that seem to only be six months out consistently. It's a running joke on the show. So, uh, I mean... <laughs> Right? I mean, you, you can't, it, it, it all comes together. Uh, final comments on that one from anyone? Did you have anything, anyone else? No, no, no not really. So, yeah. All right, great. <laughs> uh, that's our show. I'd like to thank all of our ground support patrons as well. These are people who have contributed between $1 and $2.49. Uh, they get their name in the show. They also get access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand. And uh, 
uh, Carrie Ann, who do we have coming up next week? I believe that is. Uh, oh, your, yeah. Your so uh, next week we have uh, somebody that we've had on previously, although talking about something a little bit different, a good friend of the show, Mr. Will Pomeranz, although we are going to be speaking about the Brooke Owens Fellowship Program, uh, which is uh, really, really cool things. I don't want to give too, too much away, uh, but he's one of the founding uh, partners of the Fellowship Program, uh, of course, named for the wonderful Brooke We're going to have a bunch of people on that particular we're, yeah, show. Yeah, we're getting the extra chairs for that yeah, one. Chairs and, like, we're pulling all the old all, microphones all back of, in. We're going to have oh, yeah. all of the microphones. It's mm -hmm. going to have all of the problems. It's yep. going to be great. It's going to yep. be a press conference, not <laughs> a <around the> table. <laughs> so, uh, it, should be, it should be really interesting. I'm excited for that one. Yeah. Nice. All right. Yeah. That's our show. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. After Dark is up next.